I'm Rabbi Sarah Berman. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the second of our series of reports from Israel's home front. I'm director of adult education here at Central Synagogue, where we are trying to keep you informed, keep you connected, and keep you really together, all of us together in these dark times. Um, this morning, we look again for sparks of light with our guests. Our hosts today are Rabbi Nama Kelman and Dr. Ilan Izrahi, with our special guest of the morning, Iftah Golov from Brothers and Sisters in Arms. Without further ado, I turn this over to Ilan. Good morning, everybody, and it's good to be with you again. Uh, and hello from Jerusalem as the sun is beginning to set here uh, on the end of the fifth week of this uh, still undefined, uh, wordless uh, uh, situation. Um, and I would like uh, to take us back for a moment to um, October 6th, the day before uh, the horrible October 7th with the massacre that changed our lives and changed Jewish history. Um, until October 6th, um, Israel was in an entirely different uh, disposition, this in different chapter, um, not only because the massacre hasn't occurred yet, also, but, but primarily because we were uh, consumed with a very deep social, political, and cultural um, rift between um, two very distinct um, schools of thought, political camps, um, social groups, um, ethnic groups, religious groups, one uh, aspiring to protect democracy, other one um, trying to make changes in the democratic character of Israel. Um, and I'm, I'm using very, very delicate words here to describe the extent of that, uh, of that rift. Um, and Israel was very much divided almost by half uh, into these two very opposing camps uh, with a lot of tension on the social fabric of Israel. As a matter of fact, uh, Nama and I attended uh, the Rosh Hashanah, the eve of Rosh Hashanah services uh, at Central Synagogue, which took place at Lincoln Center, and we heard live the remarkable sermon by Rabbi Bukdal about how we need to support Israel in these times, and that means to support the democratic efforts uh, to protect uh, Israeli Israeli democracy and, liber and liberal values. Um, and of course, on October 7th, everything changed dramatically, um, but not only in terms of moving from a political uh, um, controversy to a state of war, when all the rules change and everything that was true yesterday is no longer true today. But one of the interesting uh, developments of that day was that elements, many elements that were characterized as the protest movement against the government uh, pivoted in a remarkable day within minutes, within minutes and hours, and became perhaps the, the, the locus of the new um, response to the crisis when the government was uh, in some ways paralyzed in a, in, a, in a way that we will also show uh, graphically. So today we're going to try and understand what was the dynamics that took the protesters against the government and made them into the moving, to the driving force of the uh, civil society uh, effort to actually save Israel uh, in critical times. And to do that, I will, I will pass on the uh, baton to my partner here, Rabbi Nama Kalman. So again, it's wonderful to see friends, families, teachers, mentors on this call. Um, and uh, I just wanted to say that uh, Rabbi Berman, Sarah, I sometimes call the series Heroes and Heroines from the hum Home Front, because I like alliteration, of course. And you are meeting uh, some of the heroes and hero heroines in, in last week, this week, and the coming weeks, people who've really done remarkable work um, stepping in and stepping up. Um, many of you last week couldn't understand where is the Israeli government 
And I couldn't think of a, of a better uh, explanation than this caricature um, that was in Haaretz. Can you all see it, I hope? Um, basically, I believe on Wednesday, after the war started on Saturday, on Shabbat, and by the way, now being called the, the Black Shabbat. Um, and what you see here is all the ministers hiding under the cabinet table. And each of them has little uh, <laughs> signs and symbols that uh, say who they are. It's a, a lot of in-jokes for Israelis. Um, but they're basically all hiding under the table. And if you look between the chairs, you see Bibi Netanyahu's head uh, sticking out also under the table. And I think he captured uh, Amos Bitterman in the most brilliant way, the sense that Israelis ha had and continue to have as the government seems to be uh, not functioning uh, very well. And again, the miracle of civil society stepping in and taking over in the most remarkable ways and in some places, you heard last week, the local governments have done a little better. Um, I am very pleased to introduce you all to Yiftach Golov, who will tell us the story of brothers and sisters in arms, Achim Vachayot Laneshek, the NGO that began as one of the leading protest um, organizers to block the government's judicial reform and pivoted, as Elon remarked, into a massive support and welfare system to help soldiers and the in the displaced in coordination with lots of other protest initiatives, and he will describe the broad landscape who were in, who were involved and who remains uh, involved. He has a PhD in biophysics and reserve sergeant in IDF Special Forces, the Reconnaissance Unit of the Army. Uh, he wrote here, former activist in the international arena of the Israeli pro-democracy movements, I don't think you're a former, I think many of us are paused, not poised, paused and poised to come back when necessary. Uh, and in his spare time, he's a volunteer who supports disabled veterans suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. So please, Yiftach, share this remarkable story. So thank you so much uh, for the introduction. Um, if you want, because we don't have much time, um, we can elaborate the discussion later on. Um, I actually wanted just to show you a few examples of um, the main main thing here is how the protest movement, uh, I would say, filled the vacuum of the uh, the Israeli government. And uh, if you want, we can expand the sheet later on. Uh, just let me make sure that I share the screen right now with my presentation. So hopefully we'll all see it. Yeah, that should be okay. Okay. Um, so I was already introduced, so we can skip this one. Uh, but as you can see uh, in the picture down down below, um, yeah, it was I? By the way, the only reason um, I wrote down in my bio, a former, because you just mentioned that, because in, in our perspective in, in Israel, and I'm going to emphasize that later on, um, we don't consider the situation as the poorest movement anymore, as something much wider within the consensus of Israeli society right now. Um, I think most of Israelis, perhaps I'm kind of already talking about the third smoking gun, um, a bit too early, but um, many Israelis understand that th the situation is not about any protesting, but actually a struggle saving Israel right now. Um, okay, but I, I will explain that later on. So um, without going into um, a lot of iterations, I don't want to repeat what I already mentioned before, because uh, we showed in time. Um, myself, I actually... Um, opened the project of the international arm, I would say, of Achim Laneshek in Hebrew, known as the Brother and Sisters in Arm um, organization. And I was very much active uh, in both um, East and the West Coast, specifically in America. And um, the title I 
I thought about what, how, what exactly I'm going to uh, entitling the uh, this very brief lecture. So I thought of coming with this title, Israeli Pro-Democracy Protest Movement, uh, The Wellspring of Nation Strength. And the reason I chose this title, um, and it, it very, it, it's very much based on the, the, the same messages I try to repeatedly convey talking abroad, not only to the Jewish uh, diaspora, but men, but but generally to the free world, is that um, I'm not here to convince you, but as you're about to see in terms of um, evidence, um, that's that's reality. Um, the different organization comprising the uh, also known as the protest movement, actually, from from my perspective, uh, resembling the the strength of Israeli society. Um, so you can see, I just pick several of them. Um, if you're not aware of that, um, there's more than 200 different NGOs in the uh, under the umbrella of the protest movement. I thought those are the main one that worthy of mentioning here. Um, and that's basically it. Um, and because I'm a scientist, I always like adding a bit of spicy of philosophy. And um, I'm using here the code given by uh, or attribute to Aristo, nature abhors a vacuum. And of course, I'm not talking about physics right now or no biology uh but the situation in israel as described previously after i would say the transformation from october 6 to october 7th um i would say show have, have have shown to be proof that the situation in israel is that israel has citizens but we have no government and that's the vacuum um and as you can see According to Aristo, by the way, Aristo was mistakenly wrong um, in, in, <laughs> in the universe, you do have vacuum, but in Israel, you don't have a vacuum. And the vacuum um, of the government was filled by the, also know the infrastructure of the protest movements. As you can see, um, the different example that I put here in October 7th, that as you already mentioned before. So the first example I want to begin with, and it's quite already, I would say, quite famous worldwide, is the uh, that huge headquarter initiated by the protest movement led by the organization of brothers and sisters in Am, Zahim Naneshek, at the Expo, northern area of Tel Aviv. And usually, you know, they say that a, a, a picture described more than a thousand words. I'm not sure because even if I would tell you a lot and sh I would show you a, hun a hundred picture here, you won't be able to understand the scale of the capacity of the work that is being done there for the last four weeks. It's literally a little, a, mi a minor city in northern area of Tel Aviv. And uh, do you hear me okay as for now? All right, read it. Um, so put in mind that um, in this headquarter, civic headquarter, the reason it was established in less than 24 hours, so the, the pictures you see here were taken in October 9th. Um, and it's already massive, and there's a lot of people over there. There's more than 1,500 volunteers at that uh, stage, I would say. Okay, that's two and a half days after the ramming attack done by Hamas. Uh, so put that in mind. And I don't want to repeat myself much, but that was not able, um, or uh, that that will not be able to accomplish without the already uh, very efficient uh, infrastructure initiated by the protest movements and specifically by brothers and sisters in arms uh, in a very well, very much efficient and oil machine, let's call it, um, that is being propagated for and, and, and optimized for more than 10 months. So if you want to use a little cynical humor here, the helplessness of the Israeli government is not new for us. And that actually led us to being very much efficient in evolving the required machine. 
uh, right now. So um, a lot of zero sum games here. So um, just to give you some specific um, examples of what exactly is being done as for now by the civic infrastructure. And, I'm, I, and I just wanna be honest with you, this is not as you're about to see only by one specific organization. There's more than 80 different NGOs. Some of them are not actually, are not part of the formal protest movement, but they joined us because we already established the main facility. Um, so I guess that one of the main, one of the main aspects that are um, consistently being talked right now is the lack of equipment um, needed for uh, combat soldiers at the front line. You probably heard about it, the tactical equipment and the ceramic vest, and et cetera. Um, brother and sisters in arms, uh, in addition to another free um, self-made headquarters, Civic, I'm saying, um, were the one to bring more than 40,000 units um, until the IDF was finally synchronized with us and start filling the vacuum as it should have done in the very beginning. Um, I was very much involved in this um, in this aspect. If you would like, I can elaborate much later on. I don't want because I'm short in time. Um, but I was one of the main people that led this. Um, I would say this theme. If you want, I can give you uh, more specific numbers later on. Um, Another amazing thing that, um, again, occur 24 hours, we're talking about October 8th, the picture that you've seen right now, um, led by the acad uh, academy sector and the high tech sector is the headquarter of locating of the missing people. At that time, we didn't use the word hostages. A lot of people were missing. Um, so a lot of uh, AI supreme technology were used here um, because we we have it in the in the private sector, and then a lot of information um, was given in addition to insight, of course, to what's what's what what is now known about the uh, civic headquarter of the uh, families of the of the hostages. You probably heard about it, uh, led by Ronen Su and all the hashtags of uh, bring them back home. So at the very beginning, it was that. Am I okay so far? Okay. Um, another crucial thing that um, I don't want to emphasize to sounds too negative, but I guess the, one of the most embarrassing, I have to say it very personal. Um, one of the most, I would say, uh, shocking for me and actually embarrassing on behalf of the Israeli government is the fact that um, a lot of families were either evacuated because the area in Jderot, the city in the south part of Israel and the kibbutzim uh, were declared as sterile, whatever you want to call it. And uh, the government literally say to the, to the, to the citizens they have to uh, go far away without, of course, of course, taking care for anything. Um, so a lot of families just stayed at home waiting for someone to save them. Um, so Achim uh, Laneshek, and uh, followed by other groups, of course. If you heard, for instance, uh, 555, that's the forum of the Air Force um, pilots, um, were very much involved of rescuing 24 seven, using our own uh, private vehicles um, with a lot of intelligence, a lot of private teams of literally evacuating the people from the southern part of Israel to other places. And by the way, guys, you have to understand this is all civic based, okay? Like we're taking people and we're, give, we're, we're like, we're giving a call and someone in Tel Aviv saying, I have like a big apartment for six pe people to be here, done. A vehicle is running is running right now on the way, taking them out. Israel government is not involved in that. Okay, and we're talking about 10 of thousands of people and more. 
Um, so that's about um, transportation and evacuation. Um, by the way, I don't be, I, wa I want to do the, the positive twist here, but uh, as for now, you're probably aware of the situation in the North, Kiryat Shmona, for instance, and, and uh, other kibbutzim are still uh, waiting for the support and the resources by the Israeli government that happen to be, uh, they're still waiting until this very moment, um, unfortunately. Okay. Um, another amazing, really amazing project that I thought is mentioning, um, worth mentioning here is the psychological support and the welfare um, done by uh, by the uh, Women's Empowering, Bonolt Alternativa, you probably know the, the red logo here, um, followed by Moms at the Front Line and the Bevered Families, uh, known with the slogan that um, the soldier had, the, so, the, that those who died at the battlefield haven't died in vain, saving Israel democracy. So these four great groups led by amazing ladies, women's, um, are probably uh, initiated one of the most important, urgent, necessary um, aspect right now because a lot of people um, that might would have um, sorry that would might um, suffer from very bad PTSD are uh, being uh, are being um, taken care of right now by this amazing civic project. Um, and so they really doing an amazing job with that. Um, a lot of families that were evacuated, for instance, to uh, different hotels in the area of the of the Dead Sea. Um, of course, the government, as for now, is not involved. Um, so that we have a there's huge teams over there of of um, alternative solutions, alternative medic uh, medic medical, uh, psychologicals, psychiatrists, and the list goes on and on and on. That's thousands of thousands of people that are doing it completely on a volunteering base. They are not getting paid for that. Uh, the lady you see here at the, at, with the red t-shirt, she's, um, she's, she's a doctor uh, in psychology. And um, one of the most um, new, I would say, aspect that um that um are being involved by the protest movement, so called, is the uh, agricultural assistance. Um, in Israel, as you're probably aware, that the area in the south and in the Gaza Strip um, is much heavily based on the economy of agriculture. Um, agriculture has no, um, I would say, nationality. Agriculture cannot wait for the government to find the right solution and, and resources because right now the farmers are losing. I would I think it's a, it, as for now, it the uh, approximately I I've been told yesterday um, that we're losing more than one hundred um, million dollars. A, a, in a week from now, if the government will not do anything, because fruits are being decayed, of course, and there's a lot of preparation that needs to be done uh, before the winter. So I'm not going into a lot of details right now, but again, another um, amazing project uh, being done by these three groups that you can see here, Brother and Sisters in Arms, the Kippur World Veterans of 73, and the uh, Women Empowering Bonot Alternativa. On each slide that you see here, I can go on and talk for an hour, but that's not the case. So today I'm just giving you different examples of what's going on. Um, one group that I decided that I would like to shed light, I would like to use as a focal point here, is the Kippur War veterans, because I think they resemble the very essence of what's the meaning of being a patriot, Zionist, and the way, at least, that I feel that what is the real story of what's going on right now? Because they providing the best closure 
for the situation in Israel right now. You're talking about people that have undergone, that have defended Israel from existential threat in the 73 Yom Kippur War. And right now, and you're talking about 70, 80 years old people that are not waiting for anything. Regardless of the situation, some of them are not exactly in the best healthy condition. They will tell you that they will be any, anywhere at any time being back at the front line. That's the way they use their terminology in order to defend Israel against, against another existential threat, um, which is now. So uh, I chose of um, giving them another um, um moment i would say another ad extra additional time um because i feel that there's something very authentic and and i think they 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 symbolize the best in the best way the beautiful old israeli way of the what what should have been enshrined in our declaration of independence um if you want you have their website here you can read about them amazing group um and just to I would say give you a little closure. Um, so I I use I use the metaphor at the very beginning of the of the in, of this presentation with a quote attributed to Aristo: "Nature abhors a vacuum." Um, and as you can see, in reality, in in a, in 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 the situation, civic situation in Israel, there is no vacuum. And what is not when a lot of things that haven't been done by the Israeli government, by the way, not only since October 7th, but since the last two decades, um, will be done by the people of Israel. Um, that's why I used a very famous quote from, I would say, American culture, which is, we the people, um, the Israeli pro-democracy pro uh, protest movement, as I told you, is the wellspring of nation strength. And we are not waiting for the government. Unfortunately, the situation right now is that um, Israel has amazing people, uh, a lot of amazing legacy, but um, we don't have a government. And um, this is kind of leaving you with a lot of the things that you probably heard um, thought of your, on your own. But that's basically my title. Um, and I'm being proud taking or being uh, being part of this amazing um, civic project known as in my in the former old world will be protest movement. But right now I, I'm just calling it the real the real Israel, if you would like. And uh, that's it. Um, I'm here for questions or anything that you want. If you want to elaborate about anything, I can speak for hours. Um, thank you so much for your time. So I'll give you a moment to breathe. Um, so uh, as we started to mention last week, in some cases, local governments, uh, cities, regions have been more responsive to, uh, yeah, Yiftach, you can, you know, not, not share uh, now at the moment. Okay. Uh, you can stop share. Thank you. Um, so as I said, in some cases, local government has, has stepped in. Here and there, the government, you mentioned the hotels, many of the evacuees in hotels. That is a belated uh, government effort, but it's sloppy and still much of what goes on in these hotels, as you talked about, are volunteers who stepped in in all sorts of ways, supplies, food, uh, psychological uh, care, um, cultural events, um, religious events, you name it, volunteers is very much supporting even what goes on in these ho hotels and in some cases uh, kibbutzim. Uh, I believe there was already a question is who's been paying for some of this and uh, maybe Yiftah can expand on that in a moment. I will say that the protest movement was already funded to a great extent by Israelis, okay? This was one shift in Israeli society. Uh, American Jews, for all sorts of reasons, good reasons, uh, were less supportive. It was beginning to change, but I think a real sea change uh, in the in in the protest movement and now in this in this whole apparatus is that Israeli time and money 
is going into this, although there's a major, major, of course, uh, effort on part of the federation system in America, which for the most part will be going to rebuilding the the AZA envelope and working with evacuees and hopefully uh, continuing to support pluralism um, and, and culture uh, in, in Israel. So I'd like, I'd like to add that last night, one of the Israeli TV channels yeah. uh, screened a very new documentary. I wouldn't even call it a film because it's it's so fresh and it's kind of roughly edited about about the civic uh, mobilization. And they showed the actual um, moments in which the volunteers brought food and medication and 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 assistance. And in many cases, they they went to places that they were very unwelcomed before because of the politicization of the protest movement. And one of the things that the filmmakers tried to portray was how they were received uh, when they were bringing all the, all the goods and the, and the good intentions uh, to those who, who were actually on the other political end. And I would say that in that film, in most cases, uh, people who were receiving the help were very appreciative and, and basically said, my whole worldview of who you, who you were and what you were doing has changed, but also there were some who were resentful, who were saying, well, then two, a month ago you were destroying our country uh, in one way, and now you're trying to do something uh, to compensate. In other words, the, the political uh, rift is still is still there, and we have to be um, cognizant of it. Uh, but it will be interesting to hear maybe more from Yiftach how these efforts are being received by Israeli society at large, especially since a lot of the volunteers are also people who have the capacity to give. They have the time, they have the resources, um, maybe even the skills to do that. And a lot of the populations are, that are receiving the help are actually weaker populations. And there's, a, there's also something that, that needs to be discussed here. Okay, um, Sidra, you had to put a question in the box. That's how it works. So my teacher, Professor Sidra Azrafi, We'll let, I think, some questions. I'll just add, just to show you that Yiftach emphasizes how the government is AWOL. One of the vignettes they shared last night was a woman who lit a torch on Israel Independence Day. Every year there are 12 torch lighters and they're considered, you know, national exemplary uh, people, heroes, um, wonderful people. And when she saw that not one minister went to one funeral, she just got her organized the torch bearers to show up at funerals as kind of representatives of the best of Zionism. So it's okay. So Yiftach um, or Marina, do you want to focus a question? There was a yeah. yeah, there's a bunch of questions coming in. And I think one of them specifically I, um, related to what you were talking about, Ilan. Um, so this is a question from Bonnie. Um, a question about the powerful civic volunteerism now permeating Israel society, which echoes the Chalut's pioneering spirit of the past. Some of this includes the Orthodox and ultra-Orthodox joining forces, in some ways mending some of the fraying of Israeli society. Can you, any of you elaborate on that and on its possible lingering effects for later on? Um, it's a bit inclusive, General. I'll do my best, hopefully. Um, if not, please um, repeat with the, if, I mean, I'll do my best to answer this question. Um, so first of all, um, I'm, 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 I'm warning you, I'm using a lot of sense of humor because I'm German Jew, my family, and saying that, um, look, Israelis are no different than any other nations, right? And specifically here in the Middle East, um, now I'm about to say something that sounds a bit contradictional, is um, in Israel, the society seems to be more unified when we have a common denominator known as existential threats or whatever you want to call it. So I'm not surprised where suddenly you have these, uh, by the way, I don't know if you watch the telly, um, television or the radio or whatever um they all use the slogans right now of uh, we all brothers and uh, together we will win and blah 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 because it's very much 
in the DNA of of the I would say the patriotic um, sense of Israeli society or most of us. However, that's what I'm fighting right now. I'm actually using this um, what what we ask here as a, I, another hypothetical question. I'm afraid right now that that will be a, a I don't want to use deception, but um, that that will blur the frames of all the things that we just fought against of. Um, in a way, what I'm trying to say that a lot of people right now are unifying under the same common denominator, but we all understand that two months from now, um, it's not going to be a, this, the situation with Hamas, and we need to face back again um, the core problem of Israeli society, and unfortunately, Hamas is not one of them. Um, so I think it's great, in a way, that right now there's this sense, uh, sorry, it's this sense of brotherhood, of togetherness, uh, but uh, I have to be very, very much judgmental with the situation. I'm, oh, I, oh, I also deeply feel that this is a, a deception of reality. I try to be honest. Yeah, no, someone asked whether there'll be a new parliamentary system. You know, I think many of us hope there'll be a major shift. If most likely it will be to the middle, not necessarily left, but even that will be better than the current situation. Someone asked, well, what are the ministries doing with the monies that they got? And uh, well, a lot of, lot of money is going to the ultra Orthodox sector and other sectors, which has always been the history of Israeli governmental monies. Um, and again, you've talked, you might want to comment here, but it's I, true. I, I, Many sorry. of them are just simply not functioning um, in, in some way. So I can't even answer. Um, Look, it, it's the, th the thing is, let, let's pretend right, for the sake of this conversation to be try to be objective. I consider myself as a ultra Haredi orthodox Jew right now, okay, for the sake of this conversation. And now I have this situation that happened in Israel. I, I would find it completely unimaginable that my minister of treasury, whatever you want to call Smotrich, will not immediately gather all the ministers and provide all the resources, including money, for those who in need. It doesn't matter whether they're seculars or whatever. He's a prime minister uh, of, of treasury or whatever you want to call it. And right now, the, the, unfortunately, it's not that they're actually not doing anything. We already said that. But they're actually doing the, the most, they're putting a lot of effort to keep the money for, their, for themselves and not for those in need. Those are people that, that were electively chosen by the public, taking care for their own personal interests. I, I, I consider this as a, as, a, as a fraud, whatever you want to call it. They don't work for the for 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 for, for the people. They work for themselves, um, and I don't want to go, you know, giving too much uh, prolonged answers. But I'm but I, but I guess what I'm trying to say is that um, the, the good, the only good thing of horrible crisis, in general for for human beings, is that is it, that it it helps for a lot of people to wake up. Um, from very long sleeping time, using the metaphor. Marina, do you want to continue channeling questions and, and make harsh priorities? <laughs> <laughs> Again, I'll just remind everybody that things are very fluid and dynamic and what seemed so clear last week might not be as clear as priorities are, are shifting what we didn't plan in this series is what's clearly emerging as the, the hostage crisis. And will that morph into a kind of also, they're trying to very much stay out of politics, the hostage protest uh, movement at the moment. 
we're, we're told to come to vigils without any signs from the protest movements, no t-shirts, no nothing, um, in an effort to keep keep unified. So yeah. it's very hard, it's very hard to answer that question. Um, and um, we also haven't, we, we will be talking next week about shared society and Israeli Arabs. So we can't answer all the questions uh, in this session. And as we know, as we mentioned before, we know that you, you are dealing with your own crises um, as you are under tremendous pressure. Um, our Jews are under pressure about a ceasefire and, and what we're doing in Aza. And again, we are not necessarily the people who can answer those questions that Yiftah would like to maybe uh, say something about. Well, just, said. I just perhaps let's you know let's expand the make it a bit more spicy, a bit more interesting. First of all, I'm part of a strategic team that completely not affiliated to the protest movement. I'm not going into that right now. You guys know that, Ilan. But um, I I'm taking um this conversation uh, from a very different point of view. Um, from not only being a sender but also a receiver. I was very much um. Anxious, where the I mean, doing like this, yeah. The pro-Palestinian demonstration began at the different campuses worldwide, mainly in America and Britain. Um, so, just giving you another perspective, I'm, I'm. It's not only me here personally, but I'm. I'm responsible for a Hasbara advocacy team comprise more than 5,000 people right now. We're doing a lot of effort right now. What I can tell you, because other things is a bit classified with the avatars and whatever, we're doing a lot of effort right now actually fighting, I would say, this, uh, a different war of the same battle. Um, um, so we have a, 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 I consider what's going on in Israel right, in Israel right now, that's another theme, but, um, um, as 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 a battle on a global scale, it's it is not between Israelis and Palestinians, but um, that's another conversation. I'm getting a bunch of questions on Facebook right now um, about ways that we can get, send donations so that they get to all Israelis. Where are the places that you recommend? Um, how do we donate? Um, I also have a question about um, one of your slides, the, the link that you shared, um, the slides with the veterans. Um, people are really interested in that. Um, and I also, I, I guess that connects all of that, like action, those action items connect also to a question that we have here in the Zoom room, which if the government is not spending properly, then are we in North America enabling the government by donating money? So what do you think our role is also as Americans here? Uh, first of all, I would like to stay humble. I'm not sure what is your role. I've thought at the very beginning, I, I will share with you my personal perspective. When I was um, responsible forming the different delegations on behalf of uh, the protest movements coming to America, specifically to the Jewish uh, congregations, but not not necessarily uh, uh, to to Jews, I I can be the very clear message which I was taught during my master degree because I did something another thing re with regards of how to fight the anti delegitimizing organization of against Israel, BDS and, and, and others. Um, so in in my back of my mind, I always consider Jews as part of the whole organism, um, which I, or I would say I see the state of the democratic uh, Jewish state of Israel at the beating heart of this huge organism known for um, the people, the people, uh, or, or, or I would say that the great legacy of, of being a Jew. So I thought this is a great opportunity right now. First of all, reestablishing this reciprocal contract 
this reciprocality between the diaspora and Israel. Um, because I think we need to work in a different way. We need to strengthen the way that we um, um, see each other. And I think that what's, what's, what's obvious right now is that um, you see a clear correlation between um, the strength of Israel, I would say, and, uh, and the security level of Jews worldwide. Um, so that might be something that um, worthy of putting a lot of effort. Yeah, um, a lot of Israelis should understand that um, in terms of this is not the perspective of the old world. Um, for me, the situ if 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 the level of security and the level of anti-Semitism is so bloody high right now in America, uh, it affects necessarily directly. Uh, Israel is Jews in Israel. And I think this mindset has to be changed. I would like to say something about, about the uh, American Jewish involvement in this thing. Uh, first of all, as a historian, I, I also like to compare it to 1967 and to a certain degree to 1973. And in those days where American Jews were also heavily mobilized, uh, there were very uh, much central systems of gathering the support, primarily, primarily the financial support, and channeling them through national UJA and the, uh, the federations, when going to the Jewish agency and so forth. We live, we live in a different world today. And even though you can also um, support Israeli causes through cent central channels, there are so many direct ways of doing this. And I'm sure people on this call and, 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 the, and the, the other viewers uh, all have connections uh, to colleagues, to friends, to communities um, that you can support. And there's, there's really quite a bit of transparency and accountability here. And the money is not going to the government. The money is going directly to the cause that you're supporting. But I'd like to throw in also another theme that maybe we will mention it uh, in the last session of this series, that at some point, I think there's going to also be a, a, a new opportunity for involvement with Israel, not only through financial support, but through actually kind of doing on the ground in Israel. There will be what, what we see now in terms of Israeli civil society doing things will also open up channels for, for people from around the world, Jews and non-Jews, or, or the, the I, I suppose will mostly be Jewish, who will be able on the V systems, that they will be able to come and, pro, and, and provide um, and, and deliver the skills and the energies that they have in all the areas that you've seen uh, mentioned before. And there's going to be a mass scale opportunity for volunteerism and involvement in Israel. I think that that could be a very exciting moment in our in, in the renewed contract, to use Yiftach's uh, uh, phrase here, uh, of our relationship. And, and I'll just add, and speaking... Now, speaking for our sponsors in some ways, I mean, I, I'm not technically uh, savvy enough to put names of organizations, but I will supply them to Central as we, as we move along, whether it's Brothers and Sisters in Arms, whether it's um, last week it was Leib Achad, the, the, the whole you know, center, command center in Jerusalem. Um, You'll be hearing from uh, coexistence next week. I mean, these are all wonderful, wonderful causes. We can we can let you know. And I oh, I also feel very strongly. We never got a lot of monies. It's been battled for years. Is our beloved reform movement in Israel, the Israel movement for progressive Judaism. Our rabbis are on the front line, caring for their congregations, uh, creating spiritual uh, welfare systems within congregations. Our congregants are out there, you know, volunteering in all sorts of ways, and this is a wonderful moment to support the IMPJ. And they also have a whole social justice uh, platform that resonates with so much of uh, Reform Judaism in America. Also, the Hebrew Union College, uh, my institution, uh, uh, is also has an emergency fund. We we train the people who are now the rabbis out there. Um, creating services, tefillah, um, you name it. So I would urge that as well. In other words, as Elon says, you can now 
hand pick the organizations you love and they will get the monies and they are transparent about it. But I also would urge you to consider um, IMPJ, HUC, these are your brothers and sisters in the reform movement who are really, really out there doing amazing work um, every day in our 54 congregations and our various educational institutions. And that you can go on our website to see what's going on, um, for example. More questions. Marina. Marina. I'm not right seeing here. any other questions currently. I've been posting in the in the Facebook, the IMPJ website, um, on Central Synagogue's um, website. Oh, let me put my camera back on. Sorry about that. Um, on Central Synagogue's website, if you go to centralsynagogue.org, right at the front of the page, we have our um, We Stand with Israel um, webpage with plenty of resources, links to donate, ways to get involved, and ways to learn. Um, and yeah, but please continue to put your questions in the chat. Um, I can also let you know about upcoming programs that we're having here at Central Synagogue um, relating to Israel, um, relating to anti-Semitism, but I'll, I'll hold off on that until we get right to the end. So again, I, I want to remind everyone that next week we will be focusing on uh, shared society in the Galilee, um, how uh, Jews and Arabs are living together, the fears, the hopes, how that, that delicate uh, fabric, how we keep it alive and, and not just alive and thriving. We'll hear from people uh, in the field. And in our last session after Thanksgiving, we're also going to hear from people who've done actual uh, trauma work, going down to the hotels, working with evacuees, with bereaved families, and uh, also congregational work in our reform synagogue. So I think, as I said, you're going to get a, a fairly full picture. We started with more of the civic and uh, efforts. Now we're going to zero in a little more. Um, and as I say, so much is dynamic and changing. So I'll let Elon have another word and maybe Yves Tach, yeah, the last I, I word. I just want to say something about defining needs uh, I think it's one of the basic tenets of social work. How do you assess needs uh, of your clients? And, and obviously our focus in the first few weeks were for those who were directly uh, affected, their family members, those who were displaced. Um, and if you remember the concentric cir circles that I, that I showed last week, I think there's a beginning now of, uh, of, of an opening of, in, in the Israeli discourse of the impact that this is having on the entire society including people who are not in the in the inner circles of of, uh, of of being being harmed by the situation and that is basically the economic devastation that is that we're about to face here that will face that will uh, you know will influ have an impact on everyone except those who are privileged always manage to somehow survive and the weaker parts of society will feel it very strongly in terms of job loss, uh, uh, raising, raising prices, um, shortage of goods, um, and reduction of services because of the money that needs to be going to the war effort. So there's, be, there's going to be a huge amount of work in restoring uh, the level the, the level of, uh, of, of the way we lived until, uh, until this war broke out. Uh, there will be a whole economic uh, Marshall Plan, I guess, I guess you can say, in order to um, bring Israel back on course. And I, I want to ask Yiftach, I'll ask Yiftach maybe to end, and say, what what are the next steps for brothers and sisters in arms? Where do you see this incredible coalition moving? Um, I think I would say, if I, with my pulse, my hand on the pulse, my finger on the pulse, that what's also happened in these past few weeks, although there's tremendous disappointment and anger and fury uh, about the government, there is slowly, slowly, and you've talked, you can tell me, some restoration of Israelis' trust in the IDF, uh, and certainly with the mass mobilization of, of Amcha, of Israeli citizens. In other words, we keep talking about civil society, but remember there's over 300,000 soldiers 
who have gone back to the fronts. And they're also a tremendous force in what this country is going to look like uh, as well, as they're a total mix of every possible political persuasion. And so if you talk, if you can and end you with have, some thoughts. You have two minutes. Uh, three minutes. Okay. To round up your <laughs> Yes. Yeah, and thank you all. And you're muted. Make sure to unmute yourself. Thanks, Ari. Um, look, we're in a chaotic situation. I have no idea what what will happen with uh, with regard to the escalation at the north. Um. But I think you just pointed out that, um, yeah, the uh, I would say actually much of the credi credibility and uh, of, of of civilians in the IDF, by the way, was very much high already from the beginning. Um, uh, most of the uh, criticism is um, directed right now towards the uh, the government, of course. Um, I I. The only thing I can tell you, because it's based on my personal point of view, so don't believe to whatever I'm saying right now, um, but we have to be very much honest here. And the, I look at, you know, and patterns and, and process. Most of the Israelis prior to October 7th did not support, support the um, judicial overall according to essays or whatever. So most, the majority of Israel already, let's say, were at, at very one um, supporting the, those who, who, who stand strong against the judicial overall. And now I think this um, tendency is even stronger because of the fact um, that most of the people that are serving at the front line and called to reserve um, are the same people who already priorly um, stand against um, the agendas that are being pushed by, by the current government. Um, I, I think that if I would use one strong sentence i think that not only in israel but people in america should understand that in, in israel more and more people understand that it's not about right and left it's about right and wrong and um in a way it's great because we have a political crisis we have a political vacuum actually we don't have a real difference between any or none of the parties are not really different from each other except the messianic ones. So in a way, it's very good. So thank you, Yiftach, for your time. I agree. And thank you, Central Synagogue and Marina. You have the last word. <laughs> you have the last, last word. Well, thank you for I want to join us, everybody. I want to thank you, Rabbi Kelman, um, Dr. Zarahi, Yiftach, everyone here, both on Zoom and on Facebook. Um, I just put in the chat for everyone upcoming programs at Central Synagogue. We have two more of these sessions coming up, as well as an important anti-Semitism program with um, Abby Pilgrimen, uh, Yair Rosenberg, and Rachel Fish. Um, that is on Monday, November 27th. And we are also starting a three-part series with Hartman Institute, um, looking at Jewish texts um, and understanding the crisis in Israel, starting off with a program on the ethics of war. Um, and that, I believe that is starting on November 28th. So you can find all of that information in the link that I just posted. Um, and we look forward to continuing to learn with you um, at our next session. So have a great day, everyone. And thank you again.